Hey, this is Brett Gersky. Welcome to another episode of On the List. This is episode number 69. It's July 2021. We are coming to you from the Believe Podcast Network. My guest today is an incredibly talented singer and songwriter, someone I've been a fan of since I was seven years old. His concert was one of the first concerts I ever went to. Uh, he's had so many hit songs, including Right Here Waiting, Hold On to the Nights, Endless Summer Nights, Now and Forever. His new book, Stories to Tell, was just released yesterday. In it, he shares his own life story through the stories behind his songs. Of course, I'm talking about the one and only Richard Marks. What's Brett, that? guess what? <laughs> guess what? 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 You're my second interview today. My first interview opened with the, the person interviewing me reminding me that I was the first concert he ever went to. No and it, way. And it was Ryan Seacrest. Wow, Ryan Seacrest <laughs> and I have something in common. Look at that. You, do. you sure do. How are you, man? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. I've wanted to have you on as a guest for a while, but the timing could not be more perfect than right now with your autobiography coming out yesterday, Stories to Tell. So it's, I saw it's number one in biographies on Amazon, which is huge. And how does it feel that your book is now out to the world? Like people are holding it in their hands just like this. Um, honestly, it's a combination of excitement and terror. Yeah. Um, I did decide... And we'll see how long I can stick with this, but I, I, I was tempted to start looking at reviews or comments or something like that, or that kind of thing. Yeah. On some of the uh, whether it's Barnes and Noble or Amazon or whatever. By the way, Amazon, and and I noticed this because one of my one of my closest friends in the world is Matt Scannell from the band Vertical Horizon. Right. And he posted. I didn't even know that it went to number one on Amazon yesterday when it came out, but it's listed under dancer biographies. Yeah. Amazon has this really weird. <laughs> Um, sort of uh, meta data, like stuff that they do that people can't understand. And right. believe me, Simon and Schuster, my publishers, have been on their ass about it, and they just they just do these weird subtitles. I mean, these these you know these uh, subtitles essentially. Yeah. When he when he posted, he goes, "Who knew that Richard Marx <laughs> would be number one in dancer biographies?" Right. Exactly. Um, but we'll take it number one. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you know what? Those that's exciting. I mean, it doesn't mean that it's number one. It doesn't mean necessarily that the sales are gonna be huge. It just means that at that on that release day that enough people shot it up to number one. I've had this happen with albums on iTunes and stuff before. Yeah. Um, and no matter where it ends up in the long run, it's it's really gratifying to know that um, you know, that many people at that time took it that far. And Absolutely. So far, you know what I what I have gotten, which is again something you can't trust, are really really lovely emails and texts from people I know, even people I don't know that well, but just people saying, you know, I loved it and I I read it. A couple of people said I read the whole book in a day because, and I wrote it I guess in a way that was very um, they were sort of like easily di easily digested stories. Yes. Um, much like if we were to go have martinis. And I would tell you these stories, it would just be a matter of hours before, you know, you'd go, I get it, or stop talking. Or <laughs> right. Well, my copy arrived yesterday, day it came out, and I read it too really quickly because, the, like you said, the stories sound conversational. It sounds like you're just sitting there telling me the story. And, you know, uh, I loved it. I loved learning the inspirations behind all the songs and how it reflected what was going on in your life at the time. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. And you, so you get to share your own life story through the stories of each song. Uh, there's 44 chapters and most of them are named after titles of your songs, which is right. a really cool way to do it. I think it just, it probably, the stories probably just organically came from, you know, your concerts and your life, right? Is that sort yeah. of how this came together? Yes, absolutely. So it, it really sort of snuck up on me because it's, it didn't ever dawn on me to write a book. Yeah. But when I started, I started doing uh, solo acoustic shows about nine years ago. Um, and I would always still do shows with my band, but I, I, I was asked, I was invited to do three, sh three nights in a theater in Florida, in, in Clearwater, Florida. And it's a small theater. It holds like a thousand people, 1100 people, something like that. Yeah. And I was asked to come down and do a few nights solo acoustic and it scared the shit out of me because I had done, you know, for years I, had, I would do like two or three songs solo acoustic at a charity event or something just to keep costs down. And of course, you know, yeah, I'll come and do a few songs, no problem. But to do two hours of a show where it's just me 
right. and no other musicians and just me in the audience. It was really scary until I started doing it. And then I realized it was like one of the greatest gifts I ever gave myself. Yeah. Because the connection that I started making with the audiences was very different than, than when I'm doing some rock and roll show with a band. Um, and so I realized that a couple of years into doing those shows that way, that every story that I was telling in between songs, because I talk in a lot in the show, I feel like that's what people want. They don't want you to just play the songs. You, they can just stay home and listen to the records, you know? Right. They won't feel like they're hanging out with you. And and the best way to do that is just talk is to, and tell stories. And I love when people yell shit out to me from the audience. And, <laughs> right. Um, but I realized that those stories I was telling in between the songs were each their own chapter of a book. Definitely. And so the, the original impetus was, oh, well, maybe I'll re- start writing a collection of stories about these songs, the life story of the songs, career stories, not a memoir, not a, about me, because I've always been really person, a private person. Mm. People don't really have never known about my personal life. Um, everybody knew that I was married for a really, really long time. I had three kids. Um, but beyond that, I, I didn't do, I didn't talk about my life very much. Yeah. Um, so that was the daunting part when it, you know, to be honest with you, I never really got serious about it or thought about it until I got a freaking book deal. And then I was like, <laughs> now I have to dive in and really Do decide it. what I want to write about, what I don't want to write about. And so I still kept it very, <clears throat> excuse me, career oriented. I kept it very song backstory um, centric. And yeah, I, I write about some things in my life, but I, I write about them to the extent that I'm comfortable talking about them, you know? Right. And you've said yourself, you didn't have a very scandalous life that would end up on behind the music. So right. you know, your, your stories are very uplifting and mm-hmm. inspirational. There's nothing, you know, tragic and, you know, dangerous. There, you know, there are minor, there are minor things. And there's one major tragedy, of course, when losing my father. And that was hard to write about. But, of course. Yeah. But you're right. It's, and especially when it comes to my childhood and my upbringing. And I did this really cool interview yesterday with Duff McKagan, um, yeah. who was kind enough to interview me for a book event. <clears throat> and we, uh, we know each other a little bit. We're not like super tight yet. I feel like we will be, but we, we really like each other and we've had great conversations over the last few years. And I was embarrassed because I had never I didn't real. I think I either didn't realize that he'd written a book or I'd forgotten that he wrote a book. So I was like, shit, I got to read Duff's book. Yeah. So a couple of days before this interview, I started reading his book. And so if I'm only like 60 or 80 pages into it, but it's really good. But as I said to him yesterday, dude, our backstories are like, is, if I were to use a medical analogy, it would be like me saying to Duff, oh yeah, remember this? I remember this one time I was playing playing with my friends and I sprained my finger. I like jammed my finger and it hurt for days. And Duff would turn to me and go, I had open heart surgery. Right. You know, that's, the, that's the analogy. Completely different. Yep. I mean, Duff overcame such horrific circumstances and drug addiction and alcoholism and family shit. And, <clears throat> you know, I grew up in a suburb of Chicago with great parents, only child. Yeah. Loving. My parents told me they loved me every day. <laughs> you know, I, I never that. got into drugs. I, it was, totally different thing. Yeah, but you still have some amazing stories to tell. And before we dive more into the book, I have to give people a little backstory too. Here's our own quick story to tell in honor of your book. So we have a mutual friend, Rich Appel, who's the showrunner of Family Guy. And uh, this was October, 2018. I'm on Instagram and Rich Appel and I follow each other. And one day I see that he and Richard Marks are commenting back and forth under his posts. And so I texted him and I was like, are you friends with Richard Marks? And he's like, yeah, of course, since fifth grade. Since and I was grade. like, what? How have you not told me this? I'm a big Richard Marks fan. So he's like, you are? Okay, good to know. And then that night I get a voicemail. You were on tour in Idaho Springs and you left me a voicemail, which I still have. Uh, and uh, you basically, to paraphrase, you say you have two questions for me. One, why am I friends with Rich Appel since you were a kid and you didn't have a choice, but I'm a grown man and I have a choice of who my friend is. <laughs> and two, when are we going to go out and have martinis and talk about Rich Appel? 
uh, and you were like, you have my number, you know, let's get together sometime and hang out. And so I think I called you back, but you were on stage in Idaho Springs. So I texted yeah. and, you know, we've been working on that plan ever since, you know, the pandemic we'll, we'll got in the way. It. We will do it for sure. We'll over, do it for sure. Over martinis, but Rich, we did, yeah. Go ahead, tell me sorry, about, go ahead. No, you tell me about Rich. Yeah. Oh, well, no, Rich is, uh, it's so cool to have a, a friend in your life who's known you that long. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, and Rich, <clears throat> excuse me, even though I know I love interviews because it's all about me, but look, let me, <laughs> if you, you know the deal with Rich Appel, right? You know his life trajectory, right? You know, it's so unique. Oh, yeah. And so he's Rich, so Appel, Rich Appel uh, and I started knowing each other in fifth grade in this uh, school in Chicago, outside of Chicago. And we always got along really well. I wouldn't say that we were like pals in school, but we liked each other. We got along yeah. and he was the brainiac of the class. He was definitely the, the paper you wanted to copy off of. <laughs> right. And, um, and so it was clear that he was exceptionally bright and he was very scholastically inclined. And so it was no big surprise that he ended up getting accepted to Harvard University. And, <clears throat> and then I, we lost track of each other. Oh. So I never really knew what happened to Richard Pell for decades. What oh. I found out in reconnecting with him through a mutual friend in LA was that Richard Pell went off to law school um, and became the, the district attorney the, or the lead prosecutor of one of the, no, not to the DA, the lead prosecutor in Manhattan for years and was a superstar. Like, <laughs> nailing perps to the wall, like th throwing people in jail and like a con incredible prosecutor. Yeah. With probably a career ahead of him as a judge and all kinds of stuff like that. Right. And apparently one day he says to his then wife, you know what? I want to quit law and write comedy. Right. And they pack up and they move to LA. And just like every other fucking Rich Appel story, within like a year, he's a writer on The Simpsons. Then yep. he's the head writer on The Simpsons. Then he's then he's drafted by Seth for Family Guy. This guy is just um, he's he's one of the he's one of the chosen ones, you know. And totally. it's really fun to, for us to be friends because he, uh, uh, with all that he's accomplished in his career and and the life he's had as a as a father and and my career and my life as a father. And, you know, now we're both 57 years old. When we get together, <laughs> we talk about the girls in fifth grade or sixth grade that we had a crush on. And it's like, we, we're right back there. We're just total doofuses. I like that. That's amazing. Well, that also explains to people, you know, why you've done cameos on Family Guy because your mm -hmm. childhood friend is uh, the showrunner. And you even got to play yourself in a very rare non-animated cameo on Family well, Guy. That that absolutely did have to do with Richard Pell, but I have to be honest with you, the times that I've been referenced in that show before, my music and stuff had nothing. I I, cause I assumed it was it's, I assumed the same thing. Yeah. That Richard Pell was like, hey, we could get a Richard Marks on because I know him, whatever. When I when I actually got in touch with him to thank him, he said, dude, I had nothing to do with it. Seth really likes your music and yeah. it was right for these scenes and but he did uh he did ask me to do that that non-animated cameo last year, which was hilarious. But then a, the year, the season before that, he got my wife, Daisy, on the show. I saw that, um, yes, Scott, MTV Spring Break. He has a shameless crush on my wife. Uh, you know, like completely doesn't hide it at all. Right. Um, and I don't blame him, but um, he was like, I got this, we got this great bit for Daisy. If she, you think she would voice it? And I said, dude, she's a ham, she would love it. So she went down and voiced it. and. It was great. Yeah, Rich is Rich is awesome. Yeah, it's so cool. And so he got you to leave me that voicemail, which was very cool. And so I've I have seen you in person since the voicemail because in September 2019 you performed at the Troubadour in LA. Was right. that your first time performing at the Troubadour? Yes. Can you believe that? I couldn't believe it, but I was there. I was right up against the stage. It was one of these intimate acoustic shows with the stories between the songs too. So I got yeah, to see it that. was <clears throat> it was um it was, you know, shortly before the pandemic and. Yep. I think it might've been one of the last concerts I saw before the yeah. pandemic. Yeah. There was something about the Troubadour and I don't know how, even in my early days, I don't know how I never played there when I would do back in the heyday when things were like huge. Yeah. I would occasionally do a run of, you know, five or six clubs 
around the country to warm up for a big world tour. You know, we play these little places and then we'd go and play the big arenas and stadiums and stuff. Right. And I would always end up, if we did a show in LA, I would always play the Roxy or I never, and I would always go, I really want to play the Troubadour. So I don't know whether maybe it was that the Troubadour didn't want me back then, but I, I said to my agent, um, you know, a year and a half ago or whatever, I said, can you see if I can play the Troubadour? And he went, you've never played the Troubadour? You got to play the Troubadour. Yeah. And it was everything I wanted it to be. It was such a great night. It was awesome. Yeah. Your sons performed with you that night, yeah. which was really cool. Yeah. Um, so when you first started doing those acoustic shows, like you said, you told those stories. So I got to hear those stories that night that are now in the book. So what will people learn uh, about you from the book that they think they already know, but they don't know about you? Um, that I'm taller than they think I am. <laughs> okay. that I'm not this little short guy. <laughs> right. um, <laughs> They would, uh, ser in ser seriously, it, I think that what I hope that people will take away from the book, well, the one thing that they'll, that they'll learn that they would have no way of knowing really is the amount of work I've done behind the scenes with other artists, because yeah. why would they know that? People don't read liner notes. They wouldn't know that I'm the guy singing all night on all night long. You know, when Lionel Richie sings all night long. All night. That's me. amazing. Yeah. Um, People have been singing along with you on that yeah, song forever and they didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I sang on so many, I sang background vocals on so many records, hit records back in the early eighties. Amazing. And, um, and then throughout my career, you know, the other thing that people don't know, like there are people who are real fans of mine who bought my records and see me live in concert who have no, no idea that I wrote and produced Vixen's edge of a broken heart or nothing to hide for Poco or in sync's this, I promise you, or, right. you know, all this work behind the scenes with all these other artists. And so that definitely would be the number one thing I think would surprise people or has been surprising people. Yeah. Um, so that's reason enough to go get the book to find out all about that. Yeah. And also I just, I hope that people take away, somebody asked me the other day, they said, what, if you had to pick a takeaway that you want people to, to have, yeah, <laughs> they read your book. It's that I would hope that people would see and read the level of gratitude that I have for my life and my career. Absolutely. And that's something that when you're young, <clears throat> I always had a sense of it, or at least I talked the talk. I would mm -hmm. always say how grateful I was. Yeah. But I would also then bitch about stupid stuff in the <laughs> next breath, you know? Because when you're young and you think, <clears throat> you think you've got all the time in the world to be grateful later. <laughs> right. Uh, we, it does catch up with you in, in a good way. And, and now, especially being deprived of doing what I love to do for this last year and a half. Yeah. Going back to work slowly, but surely, you know, I, I'll do my first show at the end of August. Right. And as of right now, Brad, I have, <clears throat> as I sit here right now, I have 91 concerts booked for 2022. Amazing. And it'll be more. It'll probably be 150 shows for all I know. Incredible. And man, I can't, I'm so grateful to that, that I still do what I do and that people still come to the shows. And um, so that's really important to me that people understand how truly and deeply grateful I am for, for what's been going on. Yeah. And you also have a soundtrack that goes along with <coughs> what I thought was a really cool idea. I read that you got the idea when you were reading Rod Stewart's book and listening to the music along yeah. with it, that yeah. Explain that, why you have a soundtrack and how it works. <clears throat> well, I've, I, there are a few uh, memoirs and autobiographies I've read that I really liked. Paul Stanley's book, by the way, is really, really good. And that was um, inspirational to me when I was starting to really get serious and finish my book. Yeah. A few, a few years ago, Rod Stewart put out a book. And I'm a lifelong Rod Stewart fan. Right. And it's funny. And, you know, I mean, he's got so many more stories to tell than I do. Um, being older and being just, a, you know, the, the, the king of debauchery throughout his <laughs> career. And, yeah. But when he would reference a song or we would talk about recording Maggie May or Reason to Believe or any of these songs that I maybe haven't thought of or heard in a while, I just found myself always going to Apple Music or Spotify and listening to whatever he was referencing. And yeah. I sort of was doing, doing the work to create my own soundtrack. And so as I would be reading the chapter, I'd have the song playing. And so when I was finishing my book, I thought, why not take the work out of, out of it for people? And so we put out a soundtrack to the book. So it's all the hits 
of mine, which I reference in the book. Yeah. I mean, there are some that I didn't include because I didn't really write about them. Right. Um, because they didn't have particularly interesting backstories. Uh, and then a whole nother collection of tracks, everything from old demos of my early hits, should have known better, the should have known better demos on there, Endless Summer Nights demo, uh, the Right Here Waiting demo. So cool. Um, the song I wrote for Vixen, the song I wrote for Josh Groban, the song I wrote for Insane, all of my versions of these songs and some live things. And so it was really fun to put together. And um, I've had a couple of people say, dude, thank you for making this soundtrack because it's really fun to listen to as we read along, read, read the book. Yeah, it's such a cool idea to have a soundtrack that goes along with an autobiography. I think that's yeah. awesome. So I want to go over a few stats from the last 34 years of your life so people can see why you have so many incredible stories to tell. Um, so you have sold more than 30 million albums worldwide starting with your self-titled debut album, Richard Marks, in 1987, which I remember listening to back mm -hmm. then when I was seven. Uh, it went triple platinum. It made you the first male solo artist to have four singles from a debut album, Crack the Top Three, Don't Mean Nothing, Should Have Known Better, Endless Summer Nights, Hold On to the Night. Uh, Whitney Houston was the first female solo artist to do that. Right. Um, and you were nominated for a Grammy uh, for Best Rock Performance for Don't Mean Nothing. So that was album one. Follow-up album, 1989's Repeat Offender, even more successful, going quadruple platinum, hitting number one on the Billboard chart with two number one singles, Satisfied, and my personal favorite, Right Here Waiting. Uh, you were again nominated for a Grammy, this time Best Pop Performance for Right Here Waiting. A couple more stats. You've made history as the only male artist whose first seven singles all reached the top five on the Billboard charts. Uh, you've written a number one single in each of the last four decades, an accolade previously only reached by Michael Jackson. And overall, you've scored 14 number one singles, both as a performer and as a songwriter. Uh, some of those, Josh Groban, To Where You Are, which was the first hit single from his debut album. This yeah. I Promise You, Smash It for NSYNC. And of course, Dance With My Father, performed by Luther Vandross, for which you won the Grammy for Song of the Year. So we just kind of condensed your entire career into a recap right there. But how does it feel when you look back and you hear those stats and you realize how much you've accomplished? Because sometimes when you're in it, you know, it's a whirlwind and you're almost not realizing what's going on until you look back. Yeah, for sure. And I, <clears throat> I think the thing that I, one of the biggest mistakes I have made in my life and really one of the only regrets I have in my life yeah. is that I didn't celebrate those achievements and those successes when they happened. Right. Um, when I first started dating Daisy, um, you know, eight years, seven years ago, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, when we were first getting to know each other, one night she asked me, how did I s celebrate my past successes? And I said, what do you mean? What do you mean to celebrate? She goes, well, like when you would have a number one song or you have a number <laughs> one album, how did you celebrate that? Did you have a party? Did you have a dinner? I was like, what? No, I didn't. Do no, I didn't do any of that. What? She was like, well, how did you celebrate? I didn't sell it. I didn't sell it. She was, oh my God, you didn't. And I was, and I looked at her and I was like, wow, she, she's really making a point here. And I had this look on my face and she said, well, you know what? It's time to celebrate. Yeah. And, and so now I, I try to really um, be more in that, in those moments. I even did this thing. A lot of people, I haven't talked about this too much, but it's um, because of Daisy. One day I went back. I, I, thanks to Wikipedia, <laughs> and I traced the dates of every four, all 14 songs that went to number one on whatever chart, from Josh Groban's To Where You Are, to Insync to my own, to, you know, um, and I put them in my calendar on a repeating calendar, and when those, like, we, I just had, on July 4th, it was the anniversary of Don't Mean Nothing going to number one on the rock charts. Wow. <clears throat> and we just mark the occasion, so I celebrate them you know, retroactively. That's so and cool. It, it's something as simple as we'll just have a toast, you know, we'll toast the song, um, just to acknowledge the work that was done and the achievement that it, that it was. Yeah. It's a huge achievement. Uh, yeah. I'll give you, I'll give you my own, you know, Richard Marks <laughs> timeline. So like I said, I've been a fan since I was seven years old, 1987, when that first album came out, I can vividly remember being the backseat of, of the car, you know, my parents driving, my sister with me and hearing Hold On To The Night come on the radio and yeah. being like, what is this song? I like this song because I've always, I'm a writer. I've always been into 
lyrics, you know, that mean something. I always loved music from movies and soundtracks. And, and so that song was like meaningful. You know, I could tell that at a young age. And um, I remember going to Sam Goody at the Brunswick Square Mall in East Brunswick, New Jersey, getting the album on cassette, you know, and I yeah. felt like music that I discovered on my own, which was like a cool thing as a kid. Yeah. Um, and growing up in Jersey, the stations that we listened to were WPLJ, 95.5, sure, Z100, 100.3, and they were big Richard Marks, you know. Yeah, fans. they were. Uh, so we, your music was on all the time. And um, then I remember 1989 when I was nine, Right Here Waiting comes out, and that took everything to another level. I got the sheet music to learn how to play it on the piano. <laughs> like, you know, it was, that was like, that song was epic, you know, and as I'm getting older, I'm starting to understand the lyrics more. And then 1994, I asked my parents to take me to your concert at the Garden State Art Center in Jersey, now the PNC Bank Art Center. Yeah. But uh, it was the paid vacation tour. Now and Forever was the big song. I got the T-shirt. Uh, I have to find that T-shirt. Yeah, but, uh, but having said all that, you know, I associate Richard Mark songs with so much of my childhood and growing up and you know, you contributed to this soundtrack of my life, which I thought was really cool, you know, uh, and those That's are such, really cool. and they're just such formative years, you know, when you're discovering music. I see it now with my nephew and nieces when they discover an artist or a, a song and they tell me about it, you know, and they find yeah. it on their own. You know, it's really interesting what you gravitate toward. So, you know, we've had this lifelong friendship that only I knew about, but. Uh... <laughs> That's really cool. I love hearing that. And I relate to it completely. Uh, you know, as you were rattling those things off, I was thinking like, for me, it was Elton John's Don't Shoot Me, I'm Only the Piano Player. Yeah. Album, that had Daniel and uh, Teacher, I Need You and Elderberry Wine and these songs that I still love so And when I hear them, I'm 10 years old again, and I was just <laughs> discovering, and, and, and it, what you, you made a really interesting point. It's when you're old enough, even if you're still a little kid, where it, the, that music is your choice. Exactly. You know, it's not the music that your parents are playing or that your friends are, it's like you hear something, you go, I, that speaks to me in, in whatever way. Exactly. And The Stranger by Billy Joel and, um, you know, and Paul Simon's Still Crazy After All These Years album. And this is all stuff when I was like 10, 11, 12 years old. It affected me as a fan the way you just described my music did to you, which is so awesome. But the, you know, the, yeah. the difference was that in my case, those were the building blocks to me going, that's what I want to do. That's what totally. I have to do. Yeah. I want to do what those guys do. And you know, up until hearing those albums, I, I always wanted to be a rock star when I was a little kid and I always sang. Yeah, but it was those albums that made me really start to pay attention to songwriting and then me and, and me realizing I want to, if nothing else, I want to be a songwriter. I want to be a successful songwriter. And that's yeah. still to this day, Brett, with all the performing and and singing and all that stuff. The thing that means the most to me day in and day out is being a songwriter. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, I think I, I responded to it, too, you know, because I was always writing scripts as a little kid. And so uh and I still do to this day. And I think I just appreciated good writing and lyrics that were telling a story. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. right here waiting, you can visualize the story that you tell in the book. You could feel that without even knowing the story in the book that you, it's somebody missing somebody else, you know? And yeah. I noticed throughout my life, you know, 1994 is also when I discovered Dave Matthews band, yeah. who Dave Matthews is so into lyrics, you know, and, yeah. and love and stories. And so that took me through high school and college. And then for the end of college, 2001, uh, John Mayer's first album came out yeah. and I became a John Mayer fan. So it was like Richard Marks, Dave Matthews, John Mayer, these guys that contributed mm -hmm. to the soundtrack of my life that are, you know, lyricists and tell stories that feel personal, you know? So it's, those are kind of the patchwork of the, the soundtrack that, yeah. that, that's personal to me. Um, so let's do this, you know, a little inside the actor studio style or in this case inside the musicians studio richard marks edition uh so you mentioned chicago you were born and raised there yeah. uh you mentioned only child very close with your parents uh grew up in a jewish family right like me not really my father no. came from from uh, a jewish family but he was not bar mitzvah and i was not raised in any way religiously oh, well. <clears throat> my okay. mom my mom was raised presbyterian and my dad was raised as we say, Jew-ish. Okay. <laughs> Not Jewish, but Jew-ish. Right. But he always, and he was agnostic his whole life, but he, he would tell me that he, 
he felt a kinship and he felt an identity. And I was, it had to be heritage, the heritage. Yeah. And I did too. I think I, I definitely felt more aligned with my father's lineage. Um, I remember, you know, years and years after he died, I, pl I did this long tour in Germany and I played in Mainz, which is where my father's family comes from. Oh, wow. And I felt like, I, I really felt this thing. I felt like, what was it like to be a Jew in Mainz in that time, you know, and mm. my great grandfather. And so, yeah, I definitely, uh, I have a, a kinship for sure. Right. And it was a, but it was a close family, you're close with your yeah. parents. Yes. And so your father, Dick Marks, jazz musician who wrote advertising jingles, everything from Raisin Bran to Chicken of the Sea. And your mom, Ruth Marks, sang on those jingles. So you grew up in a musical household, right? Yeah, I, I joined the family business. Basically, right. I started singing on commercials and jingles when I was a kid. It was just what it was just what my family did. That's so cool. So they never said, you know, you have to be a lawyer or a doctor. No. Or <laughs> okay. Right. So they supported it from the beginning. Which 100%. Is, that's and, amazing. And, you know, Brett, I, I told this story to my kids the other day. I'd never told them this. My father was the first musician in his family, in the history of his family. Right. My father was born in 1924 and had, a, had an offer to actually be a professional baseball player. Wow. To go uh, play with the farm team for the Cubs. Um, because he was a great baseball player, catcher. But he started playing piano and he was a prodigy from the time he was four or five years old. So his gift for music and his, his, uh, his depth of musicality was undeniable. And he knew that even as an athlete, he'd be washed up at 40 years old. And <clears throat> so he decided to be a professional musician. Nice. And when he told his father at the end of college, he did, he did four years of college and he went to the war, he went to World War II. And when he decided, I'm going to be a professional musician, his father said, you're going to be a bum. Wow. Musicians are bums. So the fact that my father was like, no, this is what I'm going to do, that he wouldn't cave to any of that. When I decided, you know, I, a little, as a little boy, this is what I want to be. This is what my family does. This is how, this is, this is me. Yeah. Um, there was no pushback whatsoever. That's nice. Yeah, he basically set the tone for himself and then you and then your sons, which is really yeah, yeah, absolutely. nice. It became the family business. It just takes one person to kind of, you know, be the leader in that. Yeah. Um, and so how does a kid in Chicago become this musical superstar? You've said that uh, you have almost like a mystical ability to attract and befriend superstars since you were five. And yeah. you wrote to me, I've always had the ability to will people into my path. And I actually think I have the same thing. I had never heard anyone articulate it that way before. But I think the same thing, like I'll admire somebody and then befriend them. Um, and so explain sort of how the path from Chicago to, you know, Hollywood. Well, I mean, the no disrespect to my hometown, but the only way that it, the, the part that it played was really me leaving it. Right. Um, I, I couldn't have made it there. Uh, right. I don't, I, very, very few people, certainly in the last 50 years, um, you got to leave Chicago. There's just not enough going on there. There's, there's, there's no record company. There were no record companies. There were no, it just wasn't happening there. It was mostly happening in LA. It was happening in New York a bit and it was happening in London maybe. Right. That's about it. And so I, I was already, I'd already frozen my ass off for years enough. I didn't want to go to New York. <laughs> right. And also the opportunity that presented itself, you know, Lionel Richie heard my first couple of song demos and called me, graciously called me. And I was just going into my senior year in high school and he was so encouraging and, and, and said, you know, when you graduate, you should come to LA, man, and see how, you know, you got to try it out here. Amazing. Really like once I had that, that was, that was the, like, that was it. That was the nail in the coffin. I'm going to LA. And within a month of me moving to LA at 18, I went dropped by his studio and he had me sing background vocals on a song called You Are, which was a big hit for him on Amazing. his first solo album. And so now I had a job, sort of. I was, <laughs> was going to make a little bit of money. It didn't pay much, but it was enough to keep me going. <clears throat> Every time I would think, because I would not take any money from my parents. I refused to take any money from my parents. And so there were times when I thought, I'm going to have to get a job. I'm going to have to be a waiter. I'm going to have to do something like that. Right. Some musical job would come through to pay my rent. It could be, I remember there were times when I was about to fill out an application and I'd get a call saying, 
hey, can you, could you play keyboards on this demo at this guy's garage studio for $75? And I'd be like, oh, that's the, that's the money I needed. Thank you. You know, Amazing. Um, so Chicago really was, was a, the, the suburb I grew up in Highland Park was a great, safe, beautiful community. And I'm, and I'm grateful to have grown up there. Um, and I, and there are things about the city of Chicago I love, but the, the best decision I ever made for my career for sure was leaving it. And how did Lionel Richie get your demo to begin with? How did... So one of my closest friends in high school was a year older than me. So he, he graduated a year ahead of me and went to uh, college and, and, and where he was going to college. One of his dorm mates knew a guy who knew a guy. I swear Amazing. to God, man, it was that far removed. And they, he was a photographer and he worked with the Commodores organization. So the tape went from my friend to his dorm mate to this guy. And this is all, it's like, they weren't sending MP3s, did, you know, <laughs> electronically. Right. They were mailing cassettes around. Amazing. And it ended up in Lionel's hands. And I had my phone number written on the back and he listened to it. And the fact that he even fucking listened to it was amazing. He was the biggest star in the world next to Michael Jackson then. Amazing. <clears throat> and again, I, you know, one of the, one of the really fun things about writing this book and doing the press about it is getting the chance to talk about Lionel Richie and what an amazing guy he is. And we're still in touch. He just had a birthday on, on Father's Day and we texted back and forth and he's just, he's just a, he's a remarkable guy. And he, he's really been an angel in my life. He started it all for me. You know, he so recommended cool. me to, he recommended me to Kenny Rogers as a background singer, which led to Kenny Rogers cutting my songs, which is the first artist who ever cut any of songs of mine. And one of them went to number one on the country charts and another one right. went to number one on the eight on the adult contemporary chart. And now I'm a professional songwriter. Yep. But that all was because 18 months before Lionel Richie had called me on the phone. Right. So not only did Lionel Richie listen to the cassette, but he liked it and he called you, which is incredible. Yeah. yeah. Um, amazing. So just like he was such a cheerleader, so, yeah. so encouraging. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, I, the other thing I haven't mentioned this to anybody else because I've just, I don't know why I haven't thought of it. One of the other things that Lionel Richie did at that time was he actually took time to sit with my parents. Oh. I remember this. We went to see him in concert. With, he was still with the Commodores. And I was about to move out to L.A. And Lionel Richie, after the show, he's just played to 10,000 people, right? Instead of out going out with the guys and partying, whatever, he comes to my to the little hotel room where my parents are and sits on the floor of their room and just talked to them for an hour and was like, you know, this is a, you just know that I'm going to look after him. And wow. I mean, it's just unbelievable. That's unbelievable. important too. Yeah. He got, he gained their trust, you know? Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. I yeah. love that. Well, so the timeline continues 1985. You work on the St. Elmo's fire soundtrack. One of the best ever got nominated for a Grammy. Correct. Yeah. And then that's for the first Grammy. Uh, and then 1987, you get to release your first album, Richard Marks, which we mentioned. You were just 24 years old. You were a kid. I was 23 when the album came out, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Wow. And that had four top five singles, like I mentioned. Don't Mean Nothing, Should Have Known Better, Endless Summer Nights, Hold On to the Nights, which became your first number one single. So what did it feel like when it was so well received? Because you kind of recorded in a bubble, and then it goes out yeah. into the world, and it was such a hit. Were you like... I can't believe this is happening for sure. But it was also just such a blur because I was, <laughs> I toured between 1987 and 1990. Yeah. I mean, the first album and repeat offender, I toured 30 months out of 36 months. Wow. So it was relentless. It was uh, really chaotic and a blur and not a blur because I, like it's, I didn't ever, I didn't do drugs. Or, you know, <laughs> right. I wasn't a partier. It was right. just a blur because there was so much work and I was so focused on the next thing and, and keeping it going. Because right. I didn't want to be a one hit wonder. I didn't want to, and I was, a, and I didn't want, there's a thing called the sophomore jinx when you have a really big first album. Right. Yep. And then you, your next one is sort of like underperforms. And so I was, I remember being on the road on the first tour and just writing and writing and writing. And that's when I came up with songs like, satisfied and right here waiting and angel leah and the yep. songs that became the repeat offender album and i felt really good about the, that there was a progression that the, that the second album was going to be better i wasn't sure if it was going to 
do better, but then yeah. it just exploded. Um, yeah, the so that period of time. Under. Yeah, that that period of time was uh, was crazy, really crazy. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Um, and the title "Repeat Offender" it ended up living up to its name because it repeated the success of the first album, but also exceeded it. Those singles were satisfied. Right here, waiting, Angelia. Uh, too late to say goodbye. Children of the night. Satisfied. Right here, waiting. Both hit number one. Uh, I love the story in the book, which I won't give too much away. But you sent right here, waiting to Barbara Streisand to see if she wanted it because you thought it was almost too personal for you to record. It. You said it would be like um, publishing a love letter in the newspaper. Yeah. Um, but people can find out how it ended up as one of your songs in the book. Uh, third album, 1991, Rush Street. This is when I started buying albums on CD instead of yeah. cassette. I remember yeah. uh, it was like my last cassettes were like MC Hammer, Vanilla Ice, and Simpson Sing the Blues. And after that, I switched over to CD. It was like uh, Richard Marks, Rush Street, Boys to Men, Kula High Harmony. Those were my yeah. CDs. Um, the singles on that one, Keep Coming Back, Hazard, Take This Heart, Chains Around My Heart. Uh, what did it feel like making that third album coming off the success of the second album? Um, <clears throat> what I remember was I took a little break because my son was born. Right. Um, in 1990. And so uh, I took a breath and I also felt like I needed a, like a better part of the year to make the third album. And, and whereas I produced the first two albums with an engineer friend of mine named David Cole, I wanted to make the next the, the next album alone and just do do things myself. Yeah. And used all different kinds of musicians. And uh, I think that one thing about the Rush Street album, there are songs on there that I still really love. I mean, I still really am proud of Hazard and uh, and I take this heart's one of my favorite songs I've ever done. Yeah, I love that song. But, but a lot of the Rush Street album is heavier. It's way more of a rock album yeah and i think it threw some of my fans at the time who had gotten used to you know songs like right away and angelia and then i you know i come back with the opening track on rush through it's called playing with fire that i wrote <laughs> with steve lukather and it's like it's it, it's somewhere between a deaf leopard and a and a bad company song right and i'm singing harder and like and i looking back i realized what i was doing was, you know, I started at rock radio. My career started in 1987 with Don't Me Nothing. At, I was a rock artist. Yeah. Three years later, I'm being dismissed as this ballad guy, this soft rock guy. And I was like, oh yeah, motherfuckers, watch this shit. And I can hear sometimes when I, and I don't listen to my old records very often, but when I hear, if I have to reference something or if I hear some of those tracks, especially at Rush Street, I hear a guy really, really trying to prove a point. Yeah, maybe, maybe overly trying, you know, um, there's a song called Streets of Pain that is uh, Randy Jackson playing bass, Steve Luke on guitar and Tommy Lee on drums. Wow. And it's like probably the most the hardest rock song I ever recorded. And it was really fun. And I, it's a, I think it's a really cool song, but I'm just screaming it. And I'm like, you, it's like, dude, calm the fuck down. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's so funny. Well, with the fourth album, you returned to form 1994 paid vacation with the singles now and forever and the way she loves me you went back to the ballads. Yeah. Um, that was the album you went on tour when I went to the concert. Um, I must have played now and forever on repeat a billion times. I'm 14 years old. I'm having crushes yeah. like that was just like very formative time in my life. I remember in eighth grade when that's I was in eighth grade when the song came out we used to take this class trip to a swim club called Birch Hill and I yeah. had this plan that I was going to bring the CD single of now and forever and give it to this girl Corey as my like grand gesture and I did it and thought she'd fall in love with me like I was with her but she didn't but uh, I'm, I'm proud of myself for taking the absolutely you gotta taking go the chance it, yeah exactly but <laughs> your several times exactly so your CD single was my was my grand gesture for that song that. Um, but now and forever was like a huge hit. It was in it was in a movie. Like, how did that feel um, when now and forever really took off? And and that really was the sweet spot, like the love song. You know, yeah, it was a you know part of it was a really great opportunity to be in this uh, the theme to this movie, The Getaway, with Alec Baldwin and Kim Basinger when they were still a couple and yes, the hot they were the it couple. The movie tanked. I really liked the movie actually, but the movie <laughs> tanked 
And I thought, oh shit, you know, that, that was what we were kind of hanging our hopes on. But then the song just kept blowing up and it was a top 10 pop singer, but then it was number one on the adult contemporary chart for like, like seven, eight, 10 week, whatever it was. Right. I love it would that not song. Go away. It would not go away. Um, and then it was begin. It became such a wedding theme, and yep. you know, I've had so many people tell me that they've gotten married to now and forever, or this I promise you. Now, when people say I we used your song at our wedding, I always go, "Should have known better." And yeah, they, they don't think that's funny. I think <laughs> right, that's funny. exactly. You have to be like, which one? Because there's so yeah. many. Um, also, on the fourth album, you wrote a song I want to mention called "Goodbye Hollywood," which I thought was interesting because you moved your family back to Chicago for a little while with your, you know, three sons to give them kind of that upbringing away from Hollywood, you've since made your way back to, you know, Malibu. But um, I thought it was interesting that that period of your life, you kind of, you know, stepped away for a little bit and went back to your roots. Yeah, well, it wasn't so much me going back to my roots. There was a little bit of that maybe, but it was that my sons were of, about to start school. My oldest son, Brandon, was about to start school. Yeah. And I just felt like, I, I think I was just a little burned out on, on LA at the time. And I was 29 or 30. Um, when, uh, when I just thought, this is the time to kind of go back and be, focus on my family and less yeah. about my career, I can tour from anywhere, I can make records anywhere. Yeah. And so I, I kind of set up camp in, in a suburb near where I grew up. And my sons to this day, thank me for raising them there. Yeah. Um, there was a point where it definitely for them felt like they were living in a bit of a bubble because it wasn't the real world. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that they all loved growing up there, but they all live in LA near me now. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. So, but yeah, it was, it was more of a life decision. And, and I remember feeling like this is the, this is something I have to do now. Yeah. And so then in 1997, you had a 10 year record deal with Capitol Records from 1987 to 1997. So at the end of the 10 year contract, you released your greatest hits, mm -hmm. 16 songs from, you know, the first four albums. Uh, and it's interesting because back then we couldn't make our own playlists and download our own music. So a greatest hits album was like a mixtape right. that you could, you had to buy it if you wanted all right. those songs in one place. Um, so I remember that was very cool when that came out. And then the year 2000, song that came out that was massive, This I Promise You by NSYNC, number one on the Billboard charts for 13 weeks. It was on their album, No Strings Attached, which came out in March 2000. I've had Lance Bass on this podcast. We've talked about that song. Like you said, it became a wedding song. Uh, tell the story of when you were recording it and you were followed out the parking lot by a fan. <laughs> well, you know, this was at the peak of their stardom and they couldn't yeah. go anywhere, you know, unnoticed. And they had to like, sneak into buildings and sneak into studios and stuff. So we recorded down in Florida where they were all living for a few nights, days and nights making that record. Yeah. And the last night of recording and you know, word spread of where they were. So there were these, all these girls camped yeah. out in the parking lot of the building. Right. Hysteria. And, and they would, you know, have to sneak the guys from NSYNC in through a secret passageway in the back. Whereas I, at this point in my life, I'm just walking in and out of the front door. These girls are, they don't even know who I am or so I thought. And then this last night I was getting in my car to go back to my hotel and uh, this, she wasn't that young. She was probably like 19 or something. Uh, and I would have been 36. Right. Uh, she came up to me she stopped me. She said, excuse me, are you Richard Marks? <laughs> and I'm looking and this is beautiful girl. And I was sort of like, and she was young and I was thinking, how does she even know? And I said, yeah, and I felt kind of really, you know, compl I felt that was such a compliment. And she went, oh, my God, my mother is in love with you. <laughs> uh, oh, God. Yeah, you told that story at the Troubadour. I love that story. Yeah. It's so funny. And it's in the book. Um, another story in the book that I love, uh, in 2001, you wrote the song for Josh Groban, To Where You Are, and it accidentally ends up on a tape or an album going to, David E. Kelly, who created Ally McBeal, and he chose it to be the song Josh Groban performed on Ally McBeal, which was like the hottest song on the at the time. Yeah. And you broke the news to him. You're like, I'm sorry, but it's not part of Josh Groban's album. And he said, I think it is. <laughs> I think it is. Yeah, it wasn't me. It was like that all happened behind the scenes without my knowing. I did. I wrote in. I wrote that song with my friend Linda Thompson, and then I produced it on Josh. Yes. And unbeknownst to me, the record company and Josh had just sort of like 
they they weren't into it anymore. And this is like a year after I re recorded it. I, I forgot all about it. I wasn't sure if his record was even coming out. So then I found out that, that his album is coming out and then it was that, that that song was not supposed to be on the album. Amazing. But David E. Kelly saw Josh perform at some charity event and then he wanted to put Josh in an episode of Ally McBeal. And so he said to the label, uh, send me the album so I can pick a song from the album to use in the show. And they accidentally, somebody at the label accidentally put my song at the end of that CD, that sort mm -hmm. of sample CD. And he went, yeah, this is the one. And they were like, no, 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 that actually, that was, that's a mistake. That's not going to be on the album. And that's when he went, oh, I think it is. Yeah. Talk about a happy accident. David E. Kelly. I owe David E. Kelly. I should send him some of those royalties because it, <laughs> it, it would never have come out. Yeah, the rest is history. That song went to number one. That's a happy accident. I think someone somewhere was pulling some strings to make that so happen. Um, and then, of course, 2004, you won the Grammy for Song of the Year for Dance With My Father, performed by Luther Vandross. You've said that you perform that song still in concert, you know, as your way of, you know, keeping Luther's memory alive. Um, how much did the song Dance With My Father mean to you? And how much did winning the Grammy for Song of the Year mean to you? Well, winning the Grammy was amazing, and especially Song of the Year. I mean, that's as a songwriter, that's the holy grail, you know? Totally, yeah. Um, winning it with Luther was extra special, but also bittersweet because he'd already had a stroke. He couldn't be there at the award ceremony with me to pick it up. Um, he right. died about a year later. Uh, but he was very, very aware of what that meant. And, and, and I was with him a couple of times after the Grammys. And we talked about it. I mean, it meant so much to him to win the Grammy for Song of the Year. Um, and the song itself was really more about Luther's experience with his father. So mm -hmm. the lyrics were really driven by Luther. And I wrote uh, the music and we wrote the music together. And um, I remember when we finished that song, he said to me, quote, he thanked me. He reached out to me. We'd written a few songs that he'd recorded before that. And we were really close friends. Like we were really best friends. Yeah. And he said, man, thank you so much for writing the song with me. And he said, this is my piano man. This is my signature song. Wow. This is the most important song of my life. Wow. And then he had a stroke. And, but like I would say that, you know, the, the horrible thing is he's not with us anymore, but the great news is that he did experience the power of that song and, and the success of it. And it would mean so much to him to know. I, I have people come up to me all the time now, you know, all these years later and go, oh, my God, Dance With My Father is like one of my favorite songs ever. Yeah, it means a lot to people. Yeah. And you won the Grammy for that. I think you should have won also in 1990 for Right Here Waiting. That's my personal I opinion. I don't disagree, bro. <laughs> um, so I know you have a lot of press to do. So I'm going to run through a couple other things. So 20, 2010, you released an acoustic album called Stories to Tell. Same title as your book, uh, so people can hear the acoustic version of what your shows are like with Stories to Tell album. And then last year in 2020, you released your 12th studio album called Limitless. Your son, Lucas Marks, wrote and produced with you on that album. You guys released a single called Another One Down, produced by Lucas. Your wife, Daisy Fuentes, also wrote a song with you on that album called Let Go. The album is dedicated to Daisy. Uh, that album, Limitless, feels like a real family affair. Uh, how much did it mean to you to work with them on that album, especially um, coming out in 2020, which was just such an unusual year where we all kind of realized what really matters to us the most? Yeah, well, the album came out right like a month before lockdown. Yeah. And I was actually in New York doing Ryan Seacrest, show, little Kelly and Ryan show. Yeah. And headed to, I was about to head to Europe to start the tour for the Limitless album, and then it all stopped. Um, yeah, making the album was so fun because I was working with my son, Lucas, who's a brilliant uh, writer yeah. and producer. Daisy and I had written this song with, um, I wrote the music with a great DJ named Morgan Page, great musician, DJ. And Daisy and I wrote the lyrics. So that was really extra cool. We've written a couple of songs together. She's really a good lyricist. It's amazing. Um, yeah. But then I also worked with a couple of, I worked with this this guy named Michael Jade, who's a young singer-songwriter. Um who had done a little bit of work with me before, but this was like a full on real collaboration on the song Limitless. Yeah. Um, I wrote, I, you know, I did some work with my buddy, Matt Scannell. Uh, I, there's a song I wrote with Sarah Bareilles. Yeah. So I was working with, with some of the people who I've worked with before, but also some new people. And it was, 
it was awesome. I mean, the, the reception to the album was great. It's just such a drag that I didn't get to tour behind it. Right. Um, but I'm going to make up for it in this, this coming tour. You know, I'm going to, I'll, I'll have some new music to promote as well by then, but I'll definitely be putting in some of the songs from Limitless and, you know, another one down was a top 15 single on the AC chart. So we, yeah, it was, it was a really, really fun, successful project. Yeah. And it's fun that your sons are in the business now with you. You have three sons, Brandon, Lucas, and Jesse. You've dedicated albums to them over the years. Um, I, I've actually hung out with Jesse. We have a mutual friend, Josh Henderson. Right. And so we went out for Josh's birthday in 2019. And so when I met Jesse, I told him about the voicemail that you left me. Yeah. Uh, he loved that story. Uh, which brings us full circle to where this conversation started. So uh, before we go, I always like to ask my guests, what advice do you have for someone who dreams of a career like yours? Do it for the right reasons. Don't do it because you just want to be famous or you want money or you, those things will come if you focus on the right things. And the right, right. things are doing what you love, doing what you feel is your calling, you have to have a passion for it yep. beyond the rewards. Um, you have to really believe that if you didn't get rich doing it and you didn't become famous doing it, you'd still do it anyway. And that's really true of me for sure. Um, so that's what I tell everybody. I love that. And also you do a lot for charity. I just want to mention you've raised four million for a charity that means a lot to me, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. I had a friend, Amanda Gaynor, who lost her battle with cystic fibrosis right mm -hmm. before she turned 30. So I try to do all I can to raise money and raise awareness uh, so that they can find a cure. So thank you for all you do for charity. And the very last thing we do here at On The List is called the mystery question, where I have my guests from the last podcast leave a question for my next guest. They don't know who it's gonna be. So here's the mystery question for my last guest. I'll open that for you. My last guest was uh, Cord Overstreet, who was on Glee. Okay. And his, his dad, Paul Overstreet, is a singer-songwriter. He's done a lot of sure. number one songs for country music, so this works sure. out pretty, pretty perfectly. So Cord's mystery question for you. What's your most rock and roll story or moment? What's your most rock and roll moment? Uh, well, the first thing that comes to mind is I was doing a show in Merrillville, Indiana, on the Repeat Offender Tour. And I got, I was, I was doing a song down at the front of the stage and all the, these girls had bolted from their seats and they were packed up to the front of the stage. And I, and I had just admonished my band members the night before, don't get too close to the stage because one of you is going to get pulled into the audience and you're not going to get any sympathy from me. You can't get <laughs> so, too, too close to the edge of the stage. Well, guess who got too close to the edge of the stage that night? And they grabbed my boot and pulled me down and ripped my shirt open and and I had blood pouring like they scratched me and I had oh my gosh scratches everywhere it was um it was, the security had to come pull me out of the crowd they would they weren't trying to hurt me they loved me no of course they just kind of lost their minds and wow. I got I was in the dressing room with my shirt shredded and blood everywhere and I just looked up and one of my band members went. I thought you said, don't get too close to the edge of the stage, boss. So that <laughs> That's an amazing story. You were a rock star at that moment. Yeah. How cool. There's got to be footage of that somewhere, I would think. Right? Uh, I, hope, I hope so. I'd love but, to see it. Wow. Well, that is a wrap on episode 69. I could have talked to you for hours, but I tried to do it as succinctly as possible. We'll, we'll continue that over drinks at some you point. Got it, for sure. Um, so thank you to Richard Marks for being here. Thank you for a lifetime of music and contributing to the soundtrack of my life. Be sure to get his new book, Stories to Tell, a memoir by Richard Marks. Absolutely love the book. Uh, it's available now everywhere books are sold. Also the soundtrack that goes along with it, his latest al album, Limitless, and then go back and listen to all his greatest hits going back to 1987. Uh, so thank you again to Richard Marks. Hope you enjoyed this little trip down memory lane. I did in fact, Brett. <laughs> all the best, buddy. Good. Thank you everybody for listening and I will talk to you next time. See ya. Bye. Bye. I wanted to take a minute to talk about the sponsors of On The List, Hint Water, eBay, and Magic Spoon Cereal. So first we've got Hint Water. I've got some of my favorite flavors right here. Here's the watermelon, the strawberry kiwi, raspberry, pineapple, and I also love the crisp apple, blood orange, lemon, pear, Clementine. Uh, I love all the flavors. So what's really cool about Hint is that 
there's no sugar, no diet sweeteners, uh, no calories, no preservatives, and it's non-GMO certified. Uh, it's also vegan, contains no nuts, no soy, no gluten, no MSG. And so Hint is offering home delivery when you sign up on the Hint website, drinkhint.com. And they're offering new customers 36 bottles for $36 if you use the code NEW36 at checkout, N-E-W-3-6. So go to drinkhint.com and use the code NEW36 at checkout. And next we've got eBay. So if you like vintage sneakers as much as I do, eBay is the place for you. Here's a pair right here. Here's another pair right here. Uh, so what's cool about eBay is that they've got rare dead stock, but they've also got the latest releases. And you can find the exact pair that you're looking for on eBay. So it was actually the original sneaker marketplace, and it's still the place to go. Uh, to get the pair you've been looking for. So eBay has an authenticity guarantee, and they also have a team of independent professional authenticators performing rigorous inspections of the sneakers that you purchase before they're sent to you. So you can shop confidently knowing that your pair is the real deal. Uh, and for sneaker sellers out there, eBay eliminated selling fees on sneakers over $100. So it's free to sell or flip your collection. Other sites take 25%. But um, eBay waived the fee. So check out ebay.com slash sneakers today. And last but not least, Magic Spoon Cereal. So Magic Spoon Cereal is one of my favorite cereals. There it is right there. This is the peanut butter flavor. Um, so, you know, if you've tried to cut back on sugar or carbs or unhealthy foods in general, then Magic Spoon's the answer for you. So they've got uh, frosted blueberry uh cocoa i mix the cocoa with the peanut butter so you have peanut butter and chocolate also mix the frosted with the blueberry and they've also got a fruity flavor and everyone i've told magic spoon about has gotten hooked on it uh so the best thing about magic spoon cereal besides the fact that it tastes so good is zero sugar no sugar at all even though it tastes great it's also low carb only three grams so it's keto friendly uh, and it's high in protein, 11 grams per serving. So it's got everything you need, and it excludes all the stuff you don't, and it's just really good. So if you go to magicspoon.com slash Brett, B-R-E-T-T, you can make your own variety pack of four flavors. You can choose from frosted, blueberry, fruity, cocoa, peanut butter, and whatever new flavors they have to offer. Uh, then just use the code Brett, B-R-E-T-T, at checkout for free shipping. So go to magicspoon.com slash Brett and then use the code Brett, B-R-E-T-T, -T, at checkout for free shipping. Uh, and I will see you guys next time.